Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the ceremony of Leszek Klakowski Honorary Fellowship Award. Uh, this um, honorary fellowship uh, is an uh, award by Foundation for Polish Science to honor and to promote the research of young scholars by any nationality uh, who have made an outstanding contribution to the history of ideas or the history of medieval and modern uh, philosophy. And this is the third edition uh, of this um, award. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome very warmly all the guests who are watching uh, online our ceremony, who are attending our uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, welcome the members of the ex executive board and, and the members of the council uh, of the um, Foundation for Polish Science. Uh, next, uh, let me um, welcome the members of the committee of uh, the Leszek Kowakowski Honorary uh, Fellowship. Um, in alphabetical order, those are Dr. Dmitry Levitin from the University of Oxford, laureate of the first edition of this award, 2016. Uh, Professor Stephen Nadler from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, Professor uh, Dominic Parler, Humboldt University to Berlin, uh, Professor Bogdan Schlachta, Jagiellonian University, Kraków, uh, Dr. Katerina Tarlazzi, Kachuskari University of Venice, uh, who is also laureate of the second edition of this award, 2018, and Professor Catherine Wilson from the City University of New York. All the members of the committee of uh, our honorary fellowship. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, I would like to um, uh, to welcome researchers from scientific uh, institutions from Poland and abroad. Um, among them, um, Professor Jakub Plotskonkowicz, Deputy Dean for Research of uh, Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. Uh, Professor Joanna Odrowąż-Stypniewska from the Committee on Philosophical Sciences of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Um, Stanley Bill, Director of, the, of, of Cambridge um, Polish Studies. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome members of the family of our patron, Professor Leszek Kłakowski. And finally, and the most important, it is more my pleasure and my honor to welcome the laureate of this edition um, of, of the award, and, uh, Dr. Dr. Julia Borgerding, University of Cambridge, uh, as well as her family members and uh, her friends and her fellow workers uh, who are uh, watching us, uh, watching us uh, right now. Uh, once again, welcome everyone. And now I would like to ask um, uh, Professor Włodzimierz Bolecki, Deputy Profit President of the Foundation for Polish Science, uh, to deliver an opening speech. Professor? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody again. As it was said, I'm Włodzimierz Bolecki, the Deputy President of the Foundation for Polish Science. It is my honor to welcome and meet all of you in this boundless room, which is universally called the net. One could even say that we are all the networkers, and it wouldn't be a joke. Uh, as far as I am concerned, I prefer this adverb, universal. universal. Why? Uh, because it refers to the word university, which is very important in today's context and to the word universe. By the way, the foundation has uh, the shape of universe in our foundation plaque. So let me have a quick glance at this vast universe, which embrace a very tiny particle called the Foundation for Polish Science, an institution on behalf uh, of which I speak here. Well, uh, I take the opportunity to say a few words about the foundation, which has been in action since uh, 1991. So this year we celebrate the 30th anniversary of its birth. The foundation is non-governmental, non-political and non-profit institution which pursues the mission of supporting science and humanities. 
we realize uh, our statutory purposes by means of different kinds of scholarships, fellowships, research grants, subsidies and awards for distinguished scholars in all fields of research activity. The main rule which leads the foundation through, let us say, the universe of science and research is our motto, supporting the best so that they can become even better. Beautiful words indeed. I do like them very much, but it is far more difficult to enact declaration in a practical setting than to quote it. A very hard task indeed. So how to support those who are the best to become even better? Let me say a few words on this topic. Our support is targeted directly to single scholars and research teams, not to the institutions. All our grants, prizes and stipends are awarded on the basis of a competition. And let me add here, this is a very sharp game in which success rate fluctuates between 10 and 15 and percent and sometimes happens, it gets down below 10%. We offer our support to the researchers regardless they come from regardless the, their citizenship, their nationality, and so on. So the main and unique criterion in our programs is the quality of research. To keep this criterion, I mean scholarly excellence, we use peer review method. And last but not least, we make sure that the jury in our competitions consist of the most distinguished and eminent scholars in the fields. And fin finally, the foundation pays special attention to the transparency, openness and fairness of its activity. And that's why we place them in the frames of the ethics code, which is a ruling document for us. As I said in the beginning, the mission of the foundation is to support outstanding researchers chosen by the juries in specific competitions. The achievements of the applicants are assessed by Polish and international scholars worth renew in their fields. Few words about our programs. Our eldest long-term program called START is addressed to young researchers who are about to embark on an academic career. These researchers um, are already able to demonstrate success in their scholarly activities. The stipends they get are to encourage them to fully dedicate themselves to the chosen field of research. Then, we keep in action different team programs aimed to upgrade the qualification in the R&D sector and support the team projects conducted by outstanding scientists. Next, we build from scratch a new scientific institutions called the International Research Agendas Program. Its main goal is to conduct world-class R&D activities led by the best scientists from all over the world. And our most prestigious long-term program is the Foundation Prize, FNP Prize, awarded to the most outstanding, clearly defined and verified scientific achievements that have recently opened up new perspective in science and humanities. Well, uh, the FNP prize is followed by stipends and grants addressed to distinguished scholars who achieve spectacular success in international cooperation. 
uh, what I'm referring to are the Polish German Prize Copernicus, the Polish American Prize, and the Polish French Prize. These joint programs aim to strengthen and emphasize the value of cooperation between Polish and foreign scientists. Since 2015, the Foundation for Polish Science awarded the Leszek Kowakowski Honorary Fellowship dedicated to eminent young scholars who work in the history of philosophy till 1939 and explore Professor Leszek Kowakowski's fields of interest. Today, we have a great honor and pleasure to participate in the third ceremony of awarding the Leszek Kowakowski Honorary Fellowship to a new laureate. So I very warmly welcome and uh, very much congratulate Dr. Julia Borgerding. Julia, it's for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let me also welcome the Honorable Jury uh, who did excellent work. I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you once more. And finally, I welcome all our distinguished guests. Thank you for investing your time to join our ceremony. Thank you again. Dr. Jawoszynski, I'm giving floor. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and uh, now as a second speaker, I would like to ask um, Professor um, Jakub Klotz-Konkołowicz um, from the Faculty of Philosophy, the University of Warsaw, uh, to, um, to deliver a speech about the significance of philosophical work of Leszek Kłakowski, patron of this, uh, of this um, honorary um, fellowship. Um, Professor Klotz-Konkołowicz. Thank you very much. Um, am I hearable? Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for the invitation, dear ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw, I would like to greet uh, warmly all participants of today's event. The ceremony of awarding the Honorary Leszek Kowakowski Scholarship to Dr. Julia Morgan. First of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Julia Borgerding on becoming this year's awardee of the scholarship. I do hope that this scholarship will help you to develop your skills as a historian of philosophy and to widen your research perspectives even more. Being myself not so young anymore, nevertheless, I can still remember how important it is for young scholars to receive such signs of recognition for their work, how much energy they can gain from such an award. I wish you all the best for your research activities. And please do remember that you are kindly invited and always welcome to give a lecture at the Faculty of Philosophy of the University of Warsaw, a place that once used to be Leszek Kowakowski's home. Of course, in the near future, this would probably be a online lecture, sadly. The Foundation for uh, Polish Science, an institution, the scholarship of which I cherished myself as a doctoral student and with which I happily cooperate this very day, is uh, so kind to invite me to these ceremonies to give some short speech on the figure of Leszek Kowakowski and the role he played within Polish philosophy and more general within the Polish public sphere and culture. And I always feel that it is in a way a mission impossible. The huge importance of Kowakowski's person and his thought, the role of the key figure for the liberal opposition that was struggling to establish a free society in Poland, he played, it would not be possible to even sketch in the sh in, uh, it in a short speech I am allowed to deliver you. On the other hand, I am happy to assume that all the participants of today's event are fully aware of the achievements and the role of Kowakowski. It is indeed the name giver of the scholarship himself who would probably not be happy at all with any kind of laudation. Let me quote from the appeal 
Kowakowski once issued to one of the Polish migrant journals. I ask you not to call me names in such an abusive way as you did by referring to me as the greatest Polish philosopher, because I am not at all one. Even the name of philosopher is ridiculous. Quotation ends. Kowakowski repeatedly corrected journalists who referred to him as philosopher by saying, I am not a philosopher, I am a historian of philosophy. And what a brilliant historian of philosophy he was. His book on Spinoza, which I literally consumed during one night as a student, still stays in my mind as one of the best books in the branch of the history of philosophy I have ever read. And of course, you will not find any respectful philosophical library throughout the world which lacks Kowakowski's main currents of Marxism. Let me say that only a true philosopher, and Kowakowski undoubtedly was one of them, has a privilege to remain modest. And it is no exaggeration to call him the Polish Socrates, somebody who was always reminding that he knows he knows nothing, but in fact had to say so much, not only about philosophy, but about the condition of his contemporaries. And just as Socrates promised Athens never to let it fall into the dogmatic slumber, so did Kowakowski play this very role for our country, which was seeking its way towards modernity and rationality. What Kowakowski eventually stood for was truly critical thinking, which is never easy, never enthusiastic, and never at home in any kind of ideology. This is why I would like to quote a short fragment out of my favorite Kowakowski's book. I think most of us have their own favorite Kowakowski's book. Mine is the one about the myth. Fully aware of the power of the mythical thinking, of its role in shaping and reshaping the forms of culture, Kowakowski is at the same time warning us about the danger of subordinating oneself to this or that mythical structure. Let me quote. A myth may grow like a cancer. It may strive to replace the positive science, the law. It may even try to violently appropriate almost all the domains of culture. It may become overgrown by tyranny, terror, and lie. This warning still retains its appealing force. It reminds us never to sacrifice our critical thinking on the altar of any mythical order. Never to forget that any form of life we are participating in has its limits and its inconsequences, which can be forgotten only at the price of replacing autonomous thinking and free imagination with mythical illusions, which make, make us ignore the silent suffering and the unspoken injustice. Anticipating the lecture of this year's ORD, the title of which mentions the liberating power of the imagination, I think this is the best moment for me to conclude this short speech. Once again, dear ORD, I wish you that the liberating power of your own imagination may always accompany you in your enterprises and remain the moving force behind the scientific research you undertake. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now I would like to ask our third speaker, uh, Justyna Motrenko from uh, Foundation for Polish Science and who is uh, head of uh, awards and stipends uh, uh, section and the coordinator of um, Leszek Kowakowski Honorary Fellowship uh, to deliver a, a speech with a short summary of the third edition of the Leszek Kowakowski Honorary Fellowship. Mm, thank you, Dr. Jawoszyński for, for this introduction. Um, I have the honor and the pleasure to, to take care of the Leszek Kowakowski Honorary Fellowship 
for all its administrative and organizational matters. And today is a culmination of a multi-stage contest procedure that started months ago. And I'd like to say a few words to introduce you to this process that has led us to uh, today's ceremony. So it all started almost a year ago uh, when the jury members indicated uh, nominators for this edition of the contest. Um, nominators are no scholars working in fields of intellectual history or in history of philosophy. And they were then invited to submit the nomination for the eligible candidate. In the next stage, and nominees were asked to submit the applications consisting of their past achievements and future plans for the next 12 months. Um, in this contest, we received 17 portfolios, which is much more than, than previously. And they came from PhDs working in nine countries and representing even more nationalities, which in my opinion shows very well the broad and um, international scope of the fellowship. Um, this step was then followed by, again, a two-stage evaluation by the jury, which then resulting in choosing Dr. Yulia Bohading as a third Lesha Korkowski Honorary Fellow. Of course, my deepest congratulations for you, Yulia. And um, as you can see, uh, there were many people engaged in the process that aim, uh, aimed at choosing uh, the best and to support the best candidate and to support uh, her to, to be even better, as in the foundation's motto. And today I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those without whom it wouldn't have been possible. And first and foremost, uh, my deepest thanks go to the jury. So to the Professor Catherine Wilson, uh, to Dr. Katrina Talazzi, Professor Bogdan Schlachta, Professor Dominic Perla, and Dr. Dimitri Levitin. I must say, I'm, I'm always, and I repeat it all the time, I'm always impressed by your expertise, dedication for the fellowship and your work ethic. Um, as a representative of the foundation, I can't imagine a, a better team uh, to work towards our mutual goal. I'd also like to thank nominators who eagerly answered our invitation and invested the time to promote younger colleagues and um, by suggesting candidates. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all candidates who took part in the context, who prepared the applications. Um, fellowships rules say clearly there can be only one laureate in each context, contest, uh, but without any question, and, and it was also visible in Jerry's discussion, um, you formed a group of exceptional young scholars, and it was not an easy task to, uh, to make a decision by the jury. So thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now I would like to ask uh, Professor Catherine Wilson from City University of uh, New York uh, to read out the encomium uh, of the laureate's uh, research work. Professor? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have been asked to introduce this uh, biennium's winner of the Leszek Kolakowski Honorary Fellowship in the person of Dr. Julia Barsheding. In the 10 minutes allotted to me, I'll first review Dr. Barsheding's academic trajectory. And then for orientation to her work, I'll make some general remarks about the evolution of early modern studies. And then I'd like to give a short summary of some of the main research findings of the papers that we read on Conway and Conway, Leibniz and Margaret Cavendish. Julia Borcherding was an undergraduate at the Humboldt University Berlin, where she received an MA with distinction in 2011 after having spent some time in Toronto. She took her PhD in philosophy from Yale in 2017, where she wrote a thesis on Leibniz and the pursuit of happiness with Michael de la Roca. After a research post at New York University, she acquired a university lectureship in the Faculty of Philosophy at Cambridge and a fellowship at Trinity College. Dr. Borscherding's publication record is impressive. 
She has ignored the standard advice to turn a thesis into a book and to present oneself for decades afterwards as the world's leading specialist on that topic and that topic alone. Instead, she has followed her interests without sacrificing depth. She has been invited to write chapters in respected collections from Rutledge and Oxford on the topics of responses to materialism by Leibniz, Conway and Cavendish. Her range of reference, her nuanced and scholarly presentation in her essays and her ability to distill an argument down to its essentials won over our committee. The importance of her still very new in the historiographical literature research topic, love in early modern philosophy is unquestionable. Let me give some background to Yulia Barcherding's current research. Back in 1986, John Henry was one of the first to note in print that, as he said, right from its inception at the beginning of the 17th century, the mechanical philosophy was beset with problems. In part, he said this was an inevitable result of the hubris of the early system builders, Descartes, Gassendi, Digby, and Hobbes. In the intervening 35 or so years, Henry and other scholars have built upon this point in a number of ways. First, mechanical philosophy turned out to have a deep history. It did not spring on the world, eliminating magic and superstition in this scientific revolution. And the same is true of the detection of problems with the mechanical philosophy. These long running arguments go back to Plato versus Democritus, Aristotle versus Empedocles and other pairs like that. Second, despite all the confident programmatic pronouncements by proponents of what was sometimes called the corpusculo mechanical philosophy regarding the simplicity, intelligibility and unique scientific usefulness of that doctrine, the uh, mechanical philosophy was not monolithic and came in many versions, always with seemingly unmechanical motifs added in. There's Descartes' fermenting blood, not to mention his incorporeal soul, Gassendi's soul atoms, Digby's palingenesis, Boyle's seminal principles. And Locke, who claimed that the mechanical philosophy was probably right, thought it was completely useless to science as well as to ordinary life. Third, the supposed dominance of the corpusculo mechanical philosophy is to a large extent a selection effect in the construction of a pedagogical canon. Even in the middle of the last century, vitalism was seen as a pernicious doctrine, laid, finally laid to rest, but whose ghost in the person, I remember from my undergraduate courses, of one Hans Driesch, a wicked German influence was, might still be haunting Western science. And the dominance idea was reinforced by the wonderful books of the middle of the last century, Butterfield's Origins of Modern Science, Westfall's Construction of Modern Science, Dijksterhaus's Mechanization of the World Picture. My academic generation read these avidly and was inspired by them, but they did not give us the whole story. Fourth, and most relevant to Yulia Barsherding's research, there was a strong current of opposition to the corpusculo mechanical philosophy, drawing on ancient and Renaissance ideas of vital formulative and regulative activity in nature and what you might call semi-corporeal agency. We learned about this from some of the other books of the time, Keith Walker's Spiritual and Demonic Magic, Walter Pagel's marvelous book on Paracelsus, Brian Victor, Vickers, Occult and Scientific Mentalities, and Carolyn Merchant's Death of Nature. But serious scholars in philosophy faculties and Anglo-American institutions steered well clear of these figures and topics. What changed was that since the mid 1980s, the field of early modern philosophy became a specialist field rather than an obligatory unit of pedagogy for students to practice mostly refuting a standard set of arguments extracted from Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Scholarship became linguistically demanding, often requiring archival research, and the scientific, theological, and political contexts were brought into the interpretation. 
Instead of arguments reduced to syllogistic form, we studied adaptations, interpretations, and misinterpretations. And what made the 17th century such a fruitful field for research is that the answers to long debated questions that have been formulated in past philosophy were now discussed in connection with physiology, theory of generation, natural history, and physics. And they were also constructed in intellectual negotiation with the church. Departures from orthodoxy, and orthodoxy itself came in shades and colors, could be bold or subdued. In the process, the boundary between minor figures and major figures relaxed. We came to see the latter surrounded by supporters, opponents, often bitter ones, early adopters, holdouts, and transformers. Dr. Borscherding's own topic is theories of life and matter in the late 17th century. Some of the main questions addressed in this period included the following. What is the mind, an imperishable incorporeal substance, an effect of the brain, the flower of matter? What is matter? Is there only one homogeneous kind of it or several kinds and what are its properties? How are mind and body related? How do sensations like thirst and pain and emotions like love and anger implicate the body as well as the mind? If the emotions are not illnesses of the soul or prompts to sinfulness, how can they be conceptualized? And to what extent is the animal, especially the human animal, like a machine for living? Does it have free will? Is it immortal? And if it is, what happens after death? In Borchardt's paper on Anne Conway, she shows us Conway's response to Descartes' official dualism, the conclusion that mind and body have nothing in common but are somehow aligned in willing and experiencing. But there is also more to this paper. Borchardt shows us how Descartes' own ontology, if you take account of his letters, his minor writings, his last treatise, even the later sections of his meditations, one might mention, seem to undermine his famous dualism but not for Conway, who would not have had access to this other Descartes. Conway argues that the experiences of love and pain argue for a different ontology in which mind and body are, as she says, of one nature and substance, but coming in degrees of life, spirituality, and swiftness, and influencing one another through sympathy. There is a bit of pathos in this. Conway suffered from debilitating headaches, and perhaps there's more than a hint of feminine forbearance there. Does the argument put into propositional form succeed? Of course not, but that's not what contemporary scholarship is necessarily looking for, as opposed to reconstruction, understanding, and significance. In the next paper, Borscherding assembles a set of Leibniz's arguments for the incorporeality of the soul against the materialists who claim that thoughts could arise from the workings of the physical brain or else the agency of corporeal soul atoms. Unlike the famous Mill argument, these have not been thoroughly studied until now. Leibniz's idea was that the act of reflection of self-awareness of an I could not arise from a multitude of interacting entities. Although this argument has weaknesses, it was influential throughout the 18th century and was adapted for his own uses in his own way by Kant. The third paper contrasts Conway and Margaret Cavendish, both reacting against the official Cartesian dualism, but in different though not unrelated ways. Conway thinks of all natural things, and artificial things are of course made of natural things, as composed of the same substance, but in grosser or more subtle and active form. Cavendish, Mad Madge, one of the most creative and contrarian minds of the 17th century, moved away from her early atomism, but insisted nevertheless that everything is material and that incorporeal substance is nonsense. Such positions were bold and risky. In theory, one could be hanged for blasphemy, for denying the incorporeality of the soul, and one can contrast here the caution and hedging of Locke on the same topic. Women were amongst the strongest resistors to the official version of the mechanical philosophy. It did not fit their lived experience and they suspected it did not fit that of their critical targets either. They were shut out of experimental science where the mechanical philosophy received its applications. 
without the benefit of formal education, opportunities for travel and exchange, or the correspondence networks of their male colleagues, they worked out their own systems of nature. We study these for their philosophical architectonics and their acuity, and also as monuments of achievement under adverse circumstances. But these studies also remind us what can be accomplished in the sciences and philosophy when that adversity is relaxed, when access to books, materials, colleagues, and appointments is no longer dependent on pre-existing privilege and instead has to be earned. The award we are conferring today shows how far not only institutions, but candidates can come. Julia Borcherding's new project is titled The Metaphysics of Emotion, Love and Early Modern Philosophy. This topic will further contribute to the erosion of the boundary between Renaissance and early modern philosophy and between metaphysical ontology and theories of experience and agency. Julia has given a range of talks with some of the most intriguing titles I have come across, and I'm sure today's will not disappoint. We on the committee are persuaded she will go on to make a series of wonderful contributions to the field, and we wish her all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. It was very, a very rich and very informative presentation. And I'm sure we are all uh, right now just looking forward to uh, listen to uh, Julia's uh, honorary lecture. But before uh, this happens, let me uh, add one, uh, uh, one thing. That's what, what you are uh, seeing just right now uh, uh, on your screens. It is a scan of a diploma, of a diploma um, uh, which will be sent uh, to the laureate. That's, ha that's how it looks like, right? It's that's a diploma of a honorary um, uh, fellowship, um, Rasek Kolakowski Honorary Fellowship for Dr. Uh, Julia Borchert. Uh, uh, congratulations one more, once more. And, uh, and final, now it's time after all this, um, uh, beautiful wor uh, words about our laureate. Uh, it's time to uh, let her show her philosophical uh, skills. Uh, and um, uh, and um, I would like to ask um, Dr. Julia Borheding to um, deliver uh, her honorary lecture uh, about uh, entitled Fences and Illusions to Women Philosophers on the Liberating Power of Imagination. Dr. Bokhadink, please. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you all so much for being here and thank you so much for your kind words and of course for awarding me this fellowship. It's really a great honor and I'll do my very best to live up to it. I am of course very sad that I wasn't able to travel to Poland for this to meet all of you in person, but I'm hoping this might happen still in due time. And in the meantime, I'll just be very happy about the upside of this, uh, namely that there's so very many lovely people from all over the world on Zoom here today who can here now be here now because of Zoom. And also many without whose friendship and support, I certainly would not be receiving this fellowship right now. So thank you very, very much for that too. Now, since it was Women's Day just a few days ago, I thought I'd take this occasion to tell you a little bit more about two early modern women close to my heart, Margaret Cavendish and a little later, Emily de Chatelet. I should also say that I'm afraid this talk will take us a little past 4 p.m., but I did put in some pictures for you. So I'll pull these up now. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll begin uh, with a little bit of stage setting. Amongst philosophers of the 17th century, our powers of imagination enjoyed, as we would put it today, a bad rep. As with many ideas that would determine the course of early modern thought, it's probably fair to say that at least part of the responsibility here rests on the shoulders of Descartes, celebrated authors of the Meditations. For in emphasizing the deceptive and erratic nature of the imagination and its products, Descartes and early modern Cartesians after him removed the imagination from the realm of the autonomous thinking inquiring individual. Instead, it was transposed to an often gendered sphere of mere subjective fancy. 
Descartes' skepticism regarding the imagination was essentially twofold. First, it can hinder our path to the truth, and second, in virtue of this, also our road to freedom. For Descartes and many of his followers, freedom entailed both the ability to do otherwise and a power for self-determination. The self-determination in turn was often conceived of as rational self-determination. We attain freedom by determining ourselves through whatever ideas our intellect presents to us as clearly and distinctly true. But the imagination seemed an obstacle to such liberty with its unruly fancies impeding our search for clear and distinct ideas. So even though for Descartes, the imagination still creates the world for the mind by synthesizing sensory information, one of Descartes' meditators' first insight is that it is actually not to be trusted. It is illusory and deceitful. In dreams and hallucinations, it takes appearances for reality, and its reliability cannot be ascertained. The meditator thus attempts to resist it, and eventually denies it a part in the thinking self altogether. I consider, he pronounces in Meditation 6, that this power of imagining, which is in me, as in as much as it differs from the force of understanding, is not required for the essence of myself, that is, of my mind. For although it were absent from me, without doubt, I would nonetheless remain the same thing that I now am, from which there seems to follow that this power depends on something different from me. The imagination, he thus concludes, must lie outside my essence as a thinking being, since without it, I would still be the same thing I am now. Moreover, Descartes goes on to hold that all free actions originate in this thinking self alone. For either our will is determined by the intellect's clear and distinct ideas, or in case we don't have those, it has a libertarian two-way power which autonomously produces its own affirmations without the involvement of any other faculty at all. In short, for Descartes, the autonomous self is a thinking and willing, but never an imagining self. The Cartesian philosopher Nicolas Mavranche, in his work The Search After Truth, supplies a further variation on this Cartesian theme by describing the imagination as a gendered faculty that is much more pronounced in women than it is in men. According to Mavranche, a proper act of the imagination occurs when the internal fibers of the brain are, quote, lightly disturbed by the flow of the animal spirits, unquote, and the soul judges that the object it perceives is not outside, but merely inside the brain. However, Marbranche further explains, when the brain fibers involved are too delicate, the imagination becomes overly active and begins to misfire. And this, he explains, is one of the principal causes impeding our efforts to apply ourselves to discovering truth that are hidden. Moreover, he finally points out, this delicacy of the brain fibers responsible for an overly active imagination is more often found in the female sex. Everything that depends on taste, Mavranche explains in a section titled the On the Imagination of Women, is within their area of competence. But normally, they're incapable of penetrating to truths that are slightly difficult to discover. Everything abstract is incomprehensible to them. The style and not the reality of things suffices to occupy their minds to capacity because insignificant things produce great motions in the delicate fibers of their brains. These things necessarily excite great and vivid feelings in their souls, completely occupying it. Lovely guy. <laughs> so while grown men can hold fast and free themselves from the distraction and deception of the senses, Women are trapped by their imaginings, unable to progress to more abstract, rational, autonomous thought. Finally, some of the Baconian heralds of the new science, many of them influenced by Cartesianism, were quick to point out that the imagination and its fanciful products had little room within their investigations of nature. These investigations often took place under the aegis of the British Royal Society, founded in 1660 as the National Center for the Promotion of Science. Characterizations of the imagination as unfit for the pursuit of scientific truth espoused by the society's fellows are a recurrent theme in their writings. This theme also plays an important part in their interactions with Margaret Cavendish, one of our two protagonists today. As one of the fellows, Samuel Mintz remarks, Cavendish in her natural philosophy preferred the theories spun from her own fantastic brain. 
And Walter Charlton, family friend and fellow of the Royal Society as well, observes that her fancy is too generous to be restrained and her invention too nimble to be fettered with the exceedingly strict and rigid constitution assumed by the society in its examinations of theories concerning nature. This quote unquote rigid constitution is further described by his fellow society member, Joseph Glenwell. The society's first and chief employment, Glenwell explains, is to carefully seek and faithfully to report how things are de facto. Their aims are to free philosophy from the vain images and compositions of fancy by making it palpable and bringing it down to the plain objects of the senses. The main intent of the society is to erect a well-grounded natural history, which takes off the heats of wanton fancy, hinders its extravagant excursions, and ties it down to sober realities. Or, in the words of the society's intellectual founding father, Francis Bacon, God forbid that we should give out a dream of our own imagination for a pattern of the world. Now, my aim today is to show you that the way in which Cavendish and our second protagonist today, Emily du Châtelet, conceive of the imagination poses an intriguing counterpoint to this view. For instead of advocating that we transcend our fancies and illusions by means of a separate faculty of reason, they both assign a crucial role to the imagination in achieving freedom, understood as authentic self-determination. So I will begin by briefly introducing Cavendish and Duchatelet. For even though I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, a brief round of introductions is always nice. But since we are a little pressed for time, uh, I will make introductions not by giving you a full biography, but rather by revisiting two places that played an important role in their lives. Our first protagonist is Margaret Cavendish, who lived from 1623 to 1716, and our first place is the British Royal Society. So I mentioned the Royal Society just a minute ago, but what I haven't yet told you is that Margaret Cavendish in fact became the first woman to visit one of its meetings in May, 1667. On this occasion, Cavendish witnessed several experiments and according to diarist Samuel Pepys, she was full of admiration, although Pepys does not fail to point out that her dress was so antic and her deportment so unordinary that he was made strangely uneasy. He also does note that she was nevertheless a good comely woman. In addition to Pepys' uneasiness, there were also ferocious protests from the all-male fellows of the society, so much so that the dangerous experiment of inviting a woman into the society's chambers was not repeated for another couple of centuries. So how, you might wonder, did Cavendish get there in the first place? As so often, part of the answer is certainly connections, family connections in this case. Cavendish could take advantage of her position as the second wife of William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle, and member of one of the great aristocratic dynasties of British science, and also himself a fellow of the Royal Society. Cavendish married William in 1645, having met him while she was serving as a maid of honor at the court of Queen Henrietta Maria and he would remain supportive of her intellectual endeavors throughout her life, quite exceptionally so. Cavendish also knew via his reputable intellectual circle, many of the leading fellows such as Robert Boyle and Thomas Hobbes and others um, by some of the most famous thinkers of their day. So Descartes for instance and Gassendi. Moreover, by the time Cavendish gate entry to the society's meeting, she had already acquired quite the reputation herself. By 1667, Cavendish, who was largely self-taught, was already an accomplished writer and had penned and published a multitude of works. So there were numerous treatises on natural philosophy. There was a major work of fiction, her Utopia, The Blazing World, as well as several plays, poetry, and also two volumes of letters. Many of them stirred controversy and eventually earned her the nickname Mad Mad. But next to inviting the protests of some, her works also earned her the respect of others. I fell upon this lady, writes, for example, Constantine Huygens, father of the famous mathematician, by the late lecture of her wonderful book, whose extravagant atoms kept me from sleeping a great part of last night. 
And no matter whether they respected her or not, with her many equally extravagant hats and dresses, she was certainly a sight the gossiping high society of London was always eager to behold. The whole story of this lady, Pepys writes in his diary on the evening of April 11, the year of Cavendish's visit, is a romance, and so is everything she does. And with these words, let us move on to Emily de Chatelet and our second scene, which is equally one of Romans. So this is the Chateau de Sré, a small castle in an idyllic landscape just east of Paris. It was owned by de Chatelet's husband, the Marquis Florent Claude de Chatelet. De Chatelet had married him when she was 18 and then had three children with him while living the life of a wealthy aristocrat and member of 18th century Paris society. However, she then met in Paris in 1733, Voltaire, with whom she fell violently in love and began an affair that would last for most of her life to come. And when Voltaire had to flee Paris in 1743, Duchatelet left with him, deciding to dedicate the remainder of her life to the pursuit of science. So together they settled down in Surrey. They also set out to renovate with the agreement of the Marquis, one might add, who, rather than posing as the jaded husband, was actually quite glad of Voltaire's financial support. In an extra wing, they established a lab for experiments, fitted with the newest scientific instruments, and they accumulated a library of over 21,000 works. Siré thus became an important meeting point for famous mathematicians, authors, and philosophers from throughout Europe. It's also there that Du Châtelet would write much of her work and engaged in many of her well-known collaborations with Voltaire, which spent most of her adult life. However, Du Châtelet's collaboration with Voltaire actually, in many ways, turned out to be a double-edged sword. For while it gave her access to an intellectual community, it also led to skewed reception of her work and a view of her as essentially the handmaiden to a much better known intellectual companion. Her accomplishments and achievements thus had often been subsumed under his name. And as a result, she is, up to this day actually, often mentioned only within the context of Voltaire's life and work. Her own main work, uh, however, and her main claim to fame is a work of natural philosophy, the foundations of physics, which is in its essence, an ambitious attempt to reconcile Newtonian physics with Leibnizian metaphysics. Further writings on natural philosophy include a treatise on the propagation of fire, numerous written exchanges with leading scientists and mathematicians of the time, as well as, and you'll realize why that's important later, an essay on optics. Um, she also prepared translations of works by Mandeville and Newton, and most important for our purposes here today, she wrote a treatise on freedom, the 1737 essay on freedom, and a discourse on happiness your last picture here, composed a few years after the essay on freedom. It's also worth noting here that this essay on freedom still appears in the collected works of Voltaire uh, as written by Voltaire. However, we now uh, through the work of many good scholars actually know uh, that it was in fact written by Du Chatelet. And it's to that essay that I now want to turn. So on to Cavendish and Du Chatelet's thoughts on freedom. So a few moments ago, we saw how the Cartesians took our imaginations to impede our capacity for rational thought and thus our freedom. I will now go on to show that Cavendish and Du Chatelet conceived of the imagination quite differently. But in order to do this, I first need to say a little more about the conception of freedom. So most fundamentally, Cavendish and Du Chatelet both define freedom in its most basic sense as a capacity for self-motion. So Du Châtelet defines freedom as, quote, the power to think of one thing or another or to move or not move oneself in accordance with the choice of one's mind. But this does not mean, she further emphasizes, that freedom means choosing things arbitrarily. For an action to be truly free, we need to have a good reason to perform it. Freedom, Du Châtelet explains, has two halves. The first is our physical power of action, which allows me to indeed perform the action that I intend to perform. And the second is to be determined by what appears to us to be best. 
being so determined, she emphasizes, is an equally great perfection as the power to do what we have so judged. Freedom is thus not merely my ability to physically initiate emotion, but my ability to do so in a self-determined way. Cavendish, in turn, similarly proposes a general conception of freedom in terms of self-motion, though her underlying metaphysics diverges markedly from du Chatelet's, who views agents as us as simple and material souls like Descartes did. Since Cavendish's view is so different, we actually do need a little more background here, so bear with me. Uh, According to the vitalist and materialist view of nature Cavendish presents in her philosophical writings, any part of nature, however small or large, is what she calls an inseparable commixture of inanimate and animate matter. Animate matter is in turn of two kinds. There's sensitive matter, which is capable of sensation perception, and there's rational matter, the most agile and active type of matter. And rational matter is capable of all the activities Cavendish subsumes under a very broad faculty of reason, which includes a capacity for abstract cognition, contemplation, but also, and of particular importance for our purposes, imagination. Given that matter is thus highly cognitive, it is able to engage in self-motions, which Cavendish describes as patterning or figuring. Figuring explains all causal interaction, when sensitive matter reacts to another body's matter, it is not simply pushed around by it. Rather, it imitates its pattern of motion, moving itself in a similar way. Cavendish often uses the metaphor of a dance to describe this. When two people dance, one leads while the other imitates the pattern of movement. And this is exactly what sensitive matter does when it is affected by other matter in causation or perception. Rational matter, in turn, can do even more. Not only can it, as Cavendish puts it, dance itself into a figure, but it can also dance figures of its own invention. In this movement, in according with a self-set pattern, not with one imposed or suggested from the outside, constitutes a voluntary action. As for, Ca as for Du Chatelet, for Cavendish, freedom thus equally consists in a power to first move oneself unhindered, and second, to do so in accordance with a self-determined aim or pattern. Now, finally, there is, for both women, a very close connection between our freedom and our happiness. The motive of any free action, Du Chatelet holds, is our pleasure or happiness. Free actions are actions that are aimed at what causes us pleasure. For willing, she says, what does not cause pleasure is a true contradiction. And the actions that causes pleasure or happiness are those that pursue the passions and tastes that are best suited to our nature. Cavendish, in turn, similarly emphasizes that the most pleasurable life is one in which we can freely pursue that which brings us the most pleasure, which, according to Cavendish, is the life of contemplation nature has intended for us. For both women, happiness is thus a function of our ability to pursue the passions and goals that are true to our nature, while freedom is the capacity to move oneself in accordance with those goals. But a further question now arises. So if this is what it means to be free, can we, for Cavendish and Duchatelet, actually be free in this sense? And the answer is again twofold. So on the one hand, both believe that we have the capacity to be free. We're physically capable of self-motion and we are intelligent and so we can have self-determined aims. On the other hand, however, both also forcefully highlight the lack of both educational and social opportunities they experience as women and the way this lack limits those same capacities that would allow them to live free in this happy lives. I feel Du Chatelet reports in the presses to her translation of Mandeville's Fable of the Bees, the full weight of prejudice that excludes us women so universally from the sciences, this being one of the contradictions of this world which has always astonished me. Let us reflect briefly on why for so many centuries, not one good tragedy, one good poem, one esteemed history, one beautiful painting, one good book of physics has come from the hands of women. Why do these creatures, whose understanding appears in all things equal to that of men, 
seem for all that to be stopped by an invincible force on the side of a barrier. I leave it to the naturalists to find a physical explanation, but until that happens, women will be entitled to protest against our education. Consciously borrowing terminology from the realm of physics, Du Châtelet here describes how, even though the forces of the female understanding should by all accounts be in an equilibrium with those of men, there exists an inexplicable and, as she puts it, invincible social force, which disrupts this equilibrium. This force constrains female freedom in both of its elements. Prejudice and lack of education inhibits women's capacity to exercise their innate talents. And what is more, it actually keeps women from recognizing these talents in the first place, thus making it impossible for them to become motives for action. Both barriers, Du Châtelet reports, were present in her own case. What I have experienced myself, she writes, confirms me in this opinion. Chance led me to become acquainted with men of letters, I gained their friendship, and I saw with extreme surprise that they valued this amity. I began to believe that I was a thinking creature, but I only glimpsed this and the world, the dissipation for which alone I believed I had been born, carried away all my time and all my soul. I only believed in earnest in my capacity to think at an age when there was still time to become reasonable, but when it was too late to acquire talents. Cavendish equally observes that men endeavor to bar women of all sorts or kinds of liberty, and like Du Châtelet, often complains of the lack of education that leaves women intellectually limited despite their natural capacities. Many of our sex, she writes, have as much wit and be capable of learning as well as men, but since they want instruction, it's not possible they should attain to it, for learning is artificial, but wit is natural. In addition, she equally points out the prevalent norms bar women not just from actualizing, but also from even recognizing their true talents and goals in the first place. She also highlights the danger to our autonomy, the imposition of such foreign motives poses. They take away our ability to shape ourselves and the world in accordance with our own ideas by supplanting them with those of others. The fancies of others, she writes, drive the fancies out of our own brains as enemies to the nature or at least troublesome guests that fill up all the rooms of the house. I found a natural inclination or motion in my own brain to fancies and truly I am, as all the world is, partial to desire that my own fancies and opinions might live in the world rather than the fancies and opinions of other men in my brain. However, next to naming many restrictions on their freedom, both women also identify a potent tool to counteract them, their imagination. For both view the imagination as a powerful means to escape the webs that tie down their passions and ambitions and to thereby achieve true freedom. But they also regard it as a means to experience some of the happiness that results from realizing those passions, even while those webs still remain in place. Given such restrictions, a life suffused by our imagination, both hold, is more likely to yield pleasure than a life in which we rely on something external to us to provide it. However, as I will now show, this does not mean that the imagination merely helps us to escape the real world to then ensnare us in one of fantasy. Rather, for both women, it's a means to actualize and develop our natural capacities in a world that is otherwise too restrictive. The imagination, they argue, can help us reclaim our autonomy to make our happiness dependent on ourselves and our own goals instead of those prescribed by a world that may not privilege us. Or, in the words of Du Châtelet, let us be certain of what we want to be, let us choose for ourselves our path in life, and let us try to strew that path with flowers. So, on to, finally, the power of imagination. And first, again, on to Cavendish. So in one sense, at least, the relationship between freedom and the imagination for Cavendish is a very direct one. This is because her conception of freedom simply entails that it is the acts of the imagination that are most free. So in order to see this, let's briefly return to Cavendish's account of the nature of matter and its behavior. As we already saw, a voluntary action, according to Cavendish, is a self-motion that does not imitate or pattern something external to it, but rather, as she puts it, makes a figure of its own accord. 
both sensitive and rational matter, she holds, are capable of such figuring. But the freest action of all, she argues, are fancies or imaginations. For unlike thoughts, which are also movements of rational matter, but ones that still follow established patterns, inference rules say, imaginations do not follow any set pattern. Rather, the mind, using the most agile rational matter at its disposal, can create worlds of its own. The parts of the mind, Cavendish explains in her Grounds of Natural Philosophy, have greater advantage than the sensitive parts, for the mind can enjoy that which is not subject to the sense, as those things man names castles in the air or practical fancies, which is the reason men can enjoy worlds of its own making and can govern and command those worlds as also dissolve and compose several worlds as he pleases. The process by which the mind builds such worlds and the benefits we can reap from them are a frequent theme in Cavendish writings. Moreover, she clearly views many of her fictions as instances of such worlds. The most prominent among those fictions is certainly her utopia, The Blazing World, which also, by the way, I think has a legitimate claim to the title of first piece of science fiction ever written. In it, a shipwrecked lady comes upon a world, the blazing world, whose inhabitants, all of which are animal-shaped men, so they're ape men, bear men, bird men, etc., decide to make her their empress. The newly crowned empress then proceeds to rid the world thus entrusted to her from a whole host of earthly evils, including war, religious strife, and inequality between genders. In the blazing world's preface, Cavendish gives voice to one of her guiding motives for creating the work. Though I cannot be, she writes, Henry V or Charles II, yet I will endeavor to be Margaret I. And though I have neither power, time, nor occasion to be a great conqueror like Alexander or Caesar, yet rather than not be mistress of a world, since fortune and the fates would give me none, I have made one of my own. Like most women, Cavendish declares, she has ambitions and goals the world has given her no opportunity to pursue. But rather than submitting to life without them, she has set out to fulfill them by becoming, as she adds in the fiction's epilogue, not only empress, but authoress of a whole world. And in those worlds, composed of the pure parts of matter, Cavendish declares, I take more delight and glory than ever Alexander or Caesar did in conquering this terrestrial world. The blazing world highlights the freedom we gain both by inhabiting an imaginary world and through the very activity of creation itself. According to Cavendish's account of the workings of our imagination, when we create imaginary worlds, we proceed not according to a set pattern, but to figures we spontaneously generate from within our own depth. We are thus, as Cavendish emphasizes, not only rulers, but authors, architects, and creators of our own worlds. Moreover, by subsequently being able to inhabit those worlds, we get to imagine ways to live and act um, which the external world precludes, but which are actually true to our nature and which can showcase our talents. So this showcasing of our talents is also a theme that recurs very frequently in Cavendish fictions. So in the blazing world itself, for instance, the empress encounters numerous men of science who are all eager to engage in a sustained dialogue about their studies and will all profit from her expertise. The real Cavendish, of course, very much had the opposite experience. Similarly, in Cavendish's play, Bell and Campo, a group of women follow their men into the battlefield. However, instead of staying out of the way, as they had been told to do, they end up forming an army of their own, which, cleverly led by a female strategist, rescues their faltering husbands from defeat. Other plays, in turn, imagine scenarios in which women receive a superior education while being protected from the influence of men. In the Convent of Pleasure, the rich Lady Happy founds a female academy where women, behind the enclosed walls of a rather unconventional monastery, can let their talents flourish among themselves, their lives guided by nothing but nature's changing seasons. My cloister, Lady Happy declares, emphasizing the contrast between ordinary monasteries as places where women were often trapped in her own special creation, shall not be a cloister for strength, but a place for freedom. The creation of imaginary worlds that satisfies both conditions Cavendish sets out for freedom. 
When we create them, our mind moves and shapes its rational matter autonomously and in accordance with a self-determined pattern. Moreover, by inhabiting these worlds, we can further uncover our talents in nature and thus our true aims. Moreover, Cavendish frequently emphasizes that in providing such places of freedom, our fancies can be a tremendous source of both momentary pleasure and sustained happiness. Fancy, she declares at the start of the blazing world, creates of its own accord whatsoever it pleases and delights in its own work. Cavendish also often emphasizes that what brings about this delight most of all is the connection to nature that the exercise of the imagination lets us experience. In disproving the claim of Ben Campus military men that, quote, nature has made women like china or porcelain, and so they must be used gently. Imaginary worlds can not only help demonstrate that this is by no means the real nature of women, but they can also figure as places where women can find happiness through seeing their through talents exercised. Moreover, this happiness is all the greater insofar as our creative activity imitates the infinite creative activity of nature itself. The greatest pleasures, Cavendish writes, I take in imagination. For whatsoever the sense enjoys from outward objects, they may enjoy in inward thoughts. For the mind takes as much pleasure in creating a fancies as nature to create and dissolve and create creatures anew. For fancy is the mind's creature and imaginations are as several worlds wherein those creatures are bred and born, live and die. Thus the mind is like infinite nature. Finally, and perhaps most strikingly, Cavendish couples her advocacy of fancies as places in which women, otherwise unfree, can live their most authentic lives, with some significant resistance against the idea that we owe our external reality a privileged position. To begin with, as the passage just quoted argues, whatever pleasure we gain, gain from perceiving the external world, we can equally gain from inhabiting our own. But Cavendish doesn't stop there. In stark contrast to the Baconian warning to not mistake the dreams of our imagination for patterns of the world, Cavendish's metaphysics in fact implies that the worlds generated by the imagination do have metaphysical reality on a par with any material body. To be sure, imaginary worlds are certainly more fleeting than the rocks and chairs surrounding us in the external world. However, Cavendish argues, there's still so much more than mere fancies. For they still are material, like anything else in the world, and thus they have just as much physical reality as any other material body we may encounter. To sum up, in the words of the poet, just as the earth, the heads round ball, is crowned with orbs celestial, so head and world as one agree, nature did make the head a world to be. And with this, let us turn to Du Chatelet. In her discourse on happiness, Du Chatelet further explains her views on happiness already hinted at in her treatise on freedom. The only true motive of a free action, she reasserts there, is the desire to achieve happiness. We have nothing to do in the world, she writes, but to obtain for ourselves some agreeable sensations and feelings. The moralists who say, men, curb your passions and master your desires if you want to be happy, do not know the road to happiness. One is only happy because of satisfied tastes and passions. The most happiness in turn results from tastes and passions which truly suit our nature and which she further explains are directed towards objects or states of affairs that are actually within our control. The nature of this control is twofold. On the one hand, we need to be in control externally. Our emotions are initiated and controlled by us. They're neither the result of external force nor of unchecked desires that are pushing us towards wanting something beyond our control outside of us. On the other hand, we need to be in control internally. For when we are truly free, we are pursuing passions that are generally ours and act according to motives that arise from within ourselves rather than in accordance with motives that are externally imposed on us. The discourse then adds a further intriguing element to this view. For Du Châtelet now asserts that a crucial road to securing this autonomy that our happiness depends on is to cultivate a strong susceptibility to illusions. For we owe, she argues, most of our pleasures to illusions and unhappy is the one who has lost them. 
far then from seeking to make them disappear by the torch of reason, let us try to thicken the varnish that illusion lays on the majority of objects. Indeed, du Chatelet emphasizes, illusions are involved in all the pleasures of our life. But why, you might now wonder, should it be exactly that illusions are so essential to our happiness? Why are they not simply deceptions and possibly harmful ones at that? Anticipating this objection, du Chatelet explains, I say that to be happy, one must be susceptible to illusion and this scarcely needs to be proved. But, you will object, you have said that error is always harmful. Is illusion not an error? No, although it is true that illusion does not make us see objects entirely as they must be in order for them to give us agreeable feelings, it only adjusts them to our nature. So du Chatelet insists that there is an important distinction between illusions and mere errors. While errors entail the belief in something that has no reality whatsoever, illusions merely lead us to see objects not entirely as they must be. Moreover, she tells us what exactly it is about illusions that makes them pleasurable. Instead of deluding us about reality as errors or prejudices might, they only adjust it. As Cavendish before her, du Chatelet thus emphasizes that the products of our imagination are not mere fictions. Rather, they do have some reality of their own. Illusions are not deceptions. Rather, they merely present reality in a different manner, a manner which renders them more accommodating to our nature. As with theater performances or with optical illusions, as when, for instance, we perceive objects at a distance to be much smaller than their actual size, we are, she says, never truly misled. Optics, she explains, does not deceive us, although it does not allow us to see objects as they are, because it makes us see them in a manner necessary for them to be useful to us. Similarly, she points out, we would derive no pleasure at all from puppeteer's play if, instead of entering into its game of joyful make-believe, we instead chose to focus on the artificial nature of the figures involved or the pulling of the strings that brings about their movements. Why do I, she asks, laugh more than anyone else at the puppets, if not because I allow myself to be more susceptible than anyone else to illusion, and that after a quarter of an hour, I believe that is Polichinelle, the puppet who speaks. Moreover, du Chatelet takes care to insist, while the force of genuine error or the power of a prejudice may be inescapable, to remain under the spell of an illusion is often a voluntary choice. Some will perhaps say that illusion does not depend on us, and that is only too true, but up to a point. We cannot give ourselves illusions any more than we can give ourselves tastes or passions, but we can keep the illusions that we have. We can seek not to destroy them. We can choose not to go behind the set to see the wheels that make flight and the other machines of theatrical productions. But while we might understand how illusions may adjust the world to our nature and purposes in the case of optics or a theatrical performance, we might still wonder, how can they help us achieve the control and freedom on which, according to de Chatelet, our happiness so crucially depends? They do so, de Chatelet argues, in two important ways, which I think very much mirror the functions of Cavendish's imaginary worlds. First, like Cavendish fancies, de Chatelet's illusion help render our happiness independent of features of the external world that may be entirely of out of our control. Instead, they shift the focus on how we perceive and experience this world internally, where the imagination may adjust our perceptions to our own needs and desires. The passion in pursuit of which, according to de Chatelet, illusions are most effective is romantic love. When we love, she explains, we shouldn't make our fate dependent on the person loved. Rather, we should make it dependent on the experience of love as we are creating and imagining it for us, which can truly suit our needs and sustain the pleasure that arises from our own affection. At certain points, of course, the world and the people in it may entirely refuse to cooperate, love often being a case in point, I take it, and thus illusion, if maintained, will indeed turn into error. For such circumstances, Du Chatelet advises the cultivation of passions that can be pursued entirely autonomously. Most importantly, she suggests that we develop a taste for study, 
which she says makes our happiness dependent only on ourselves. However, along with this last piece of advice, a new question immediately seems to arise. For how, recalling Du Chatelet's claim that illusions are involved in all pleasures of our life, could illusion play a helpful role with respect to this particular taste, this taste for study? Du Chatelet's answer to this question highlights a second important role that illusion play for her in securing the autonomous pursuit of our passions and does our happiness. Like Cavendish's imaginary worlds, Du Chatelet's illusions can help us to develop our talents, even if these aren't recognized by the world that surrounds us. This is because they can help us to create and maintain state of minds that enable us to still pursue our passions or actualize our abilities when the world, as in the case of our female protagonist's pursuits of philosophy and science, may do little to support or even acknowledge them. But which illusion in particular might it be, we might still ask, that could be connected to our love of study, or perhaps a lot more generally, to our intellectual pursuits? Now, to start with, note that the passion du Châtelet identifies as driving many of our intellectual endeavors and as generating much of the happiness we derive from them is the love of glory. But she observes that while there are a thousand doors to fame open to men who have the ability, quote, to make the towns useful to the country and to serve their fellow citizens, the same doors are shut tight for women. She identifies only one that remains and that may promise an equivalent happiness. And that is the exercise of our intellectual talents in the form of our love of study. So she writes, if we value independence, the love of study is of all the passions, the one that contributes most to our happiness. This love of study holds within it a passion from which a superior soul is never entirely exempt, that of glory. Undeniably, the love of study is much less necessary to the happiness of men than it is to that of women. Men have infinite resources for the happiness that women lack. They have many means to attain glory, but women are excluded by definition from every kind of glory. And when by chance one is born with a rather superior soul, only study remains to console her for all the exclusions and all the dependencies to which she finds herself condemned by her place in society. So how does illusion help us here? It does, du Chatelet suggests, by helping us create and maintain the hopeful illusion of a future in which our work may be appreciated so that we may enjoy at least a little bit of the happiness fame provides already in a present that won't grant us to us. The love of glory that is the source of so many pleasures of the soul and of so many efforts of all souls that contribute to the happiness, the instruction, the perfection of society is entirely founded on illusion. Philosophy would have us feel the vanity of it, but the feeling prevails and this pleasure is not an illusion for it proves to us the very real benefit of enjoying our future reputation. We're made happy in the present moment, not only by our actual delights, but also by our hopes, our reminiscences. The present is enriched by the past and the future. Strikingly, the very same motive of the pursuit of fame and the happiness that results from achieving it, or in the case of women like Du Chatelet, the ability to imagine or hope that one may achieve it, is also a very frequent theme in Cavendish writings. Like Du Chatelet, she often observes that most roads to fame are close to her in real life. She thus declares that she will rely on imaginary worlds instead, worlds where it is indeed possible for women like herself to attain recognition and glory, be it as the wise ruler of a blazing world or as the successful general on the battlefield. Finally, and here again at one with Chatelet, Cavendish equally expresses the hope that the only road to fame that does seem open to her, the pursuit of her writing, will ultimately bring her at least some of the recognition she deserves. So if my writing, she says, please the readers, though not the learned, it will satisfy me. For I had rather be praised than this by the most, although not by the best. For all I desire is fame, and fame is nothing but a great noise, and noise lives the most in the multitude. And so, she adds, since all heroic actions, public employments, as well as civil as military and eloquent pleadings are the night my sex in this age, I may be excused for writing so much. And so, I hope, will I. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Yulia, for this uh, outstanding, uh, inspi most inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, your lecture um, showed us that there are still so many uh, fresh and uh, important things uh, uh, to be said in, in the field of uh, 13th uh, century philosophy, uh, in the field which was so important to the patron of our award, Leszek Klakowski. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it was the, unfortunately, it was the last point um, of uh, our ceremony. I would like to um, thank you for attending this um, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all the participants and, and all the panelists and all the, uh, who, um, um, who attended our um, uh, webinar. Um, congratulations once more. Thank you very much and goodbye.